Hi, my name is Sharon Chen, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician at Stanford University. This video is an overview of protozoan and animal parasites. It is part of our introduction to microbiology series. The learning objectives are to explain main differences between protozoa, helminth, and arthropod parasites of humans, to recognize that although parasitic infections are often asymptomatic, they represent a high burden of disease worldwide, to discuss differences in parasitic disease in comparison with bacteria and viruses, to explain how complex life cycles of parasites affect pathogenesis, and to visualize the main groups of parasites of humans and give some examples in each group. I want to first give you an overview of you know, what are parasites. Parasitism is defined as one organism living off of another. All organisms have their own parasites, but they're host restricted. Now, for physicians, we are most concerned about parasites of humans. Parasites have adapted to hosts with specificity. Let me give you an example. The image you see on the slide is a head louse, which crawls around in the hair, as a good illustration of the concept of a specific adaptation to a host. Lice that infect humans have a different shaped hook on their legs compared to lice infecting other animals. That specific hook of human louse enables it to climb human hair better compared to other animal hair. Parasites have also adapted to hosts for their entire life cycle. So the different stages of a parasite, for example, a larval stage, might be in a different host. It makes the life cycles complex, and you might be thinking that this goes against what I just said about host specificity. However, reproduction of the parasite is usually in a single host and is consistent with parasites adapting to a specific host. In medicine, we define parasites in two groups. The first are protozoa, which are single-cell eukaryotes, and the second are eukaryotic multicellular animals, which include helminths, also known as worms. There are two types of worms, the round worms, or nematodes, and the flat worms, which are the flukes, or trematodes, and the tapeworms, or cestodes. Multicellular animals also include ectoparasites, which are the arthropods, that is insects, ticks, and mites. In the United States, Parasite infections are not as common compared to developing countries. In fact, parasite infections are the most common type of infection in developing countries. This may be in part because of their insufficient public health infrastructure, which can lead to problems with even getting clean water. The high incidence of parasite infections in developing countries is not only a health problem, but also an economic problem. Experts in the field postulate that it's one of the reasons that the bottom billion poorest people can't escape poverty. There are specific populations that are disproportionately affected. For example, agricultural workers have more parasite infections, partly due to their close exposure to soil, sewage, dirty water, and animals. Work productivity goes down when they're infected because parasite infections are chronic and disabling, especially when not appropriately diagnosed or treated. Mothers and children are also disproportionately affected with parasite infections, and this can reduce the economic potential for the family. Pregnant women infected with specific helminths, like hookworm and schistosoma, can have severe anemia, and this can lead to morbidity and mortality of both the mother and the baby. Children with helminth infections suffer from growth stunting, that is, they don't grow well, and cognitive disabilities. They don't do as well in school and end up potentially decreasing their future earnings. There's a recent recognition that the parasite burden disease is not just in developing countries, but also exists in situations of social economic inequality in any country. People who live in relative poverty within developed middle and high income countries are disproportionately affected by parasite infections in addition to other infections and diseases. I'm not just referring to other parts of the world. These pockets of relative poverty include people in the southern part of the United States. Similar to the pattern in developing countries, the same specific populations, that is, workers, children, pregnant women, are disproportionately affected. And because of the economic consequences, these families may remain in a pattern of relative poverty. They, too, can't escape. The picture you see is a woman with chronic lymphedema. A mosquito bit her, injected a roundworm into her, and over time she developed this very disfiguring, physically limited abnormality of her leg. Just imagine trying to do manual labor with this leg. This woman has had this infection for a long time, but it hasn't killed her. It's a good illustration that parasite infections tend to be chronic, but they don't kill people. 
Helminths are larger than bacteria and viruses, and so how they cause disease in the host is a little bit different. The woman with the abnormal leg that I just showed you has lymphedema from adult worms that blocked up her lymph vessels. The immune response to dying worms can also cause disease. For example, some people with neurocystocercosis, this is an infection by a tapeworm called tinea solium, can establish larval cysts in the brain. And these larval cysts can grow and survive for many years, evading the immune system. The brain MRI in this slide shows you several of the larval cysts. They are those enhancing round foci. And when the larval cysts begin to die, they induce an immune response, which can lead to irritation of the brain, causing seizures. Migrating but not dying worms can also elicit an immune response. Leffler syndrome is an example of a resulting disease. It's a transient, self-limited respiratory illness from larvae migrating around in the lung tissue. It causes an acute hypersensitivity response, leading to symptoms of cough, chest pain, wheezing, sometimes blood streak sputum. Eosinophils can be seen in the sputum and eventually in the peripheral blood. Unlike Leffler syndrome, where no tissue damage occurs, protozoa, like plasmodium, can cause tissue damage. A main symptom of malaria is fever, and this is caused by the synchronized bursting of millions of plasmodia out of the red blood cells. Plasmodium falciparum bursts out of the red blood cells every three days. This is called tertian fever. A different plasmodium species, malaria, bursts out of the red blood cells every four days, and this is called quartan fever. I've given you several examples of how parasites can cause disease. It's important to realize, though, that many parasitic infections in humans don't cause disease and are asymptomatic, and this is because there's a balance between the parasite and the host immunity. Now, if that balance is disrupted, such as in an immune-compromised patient, the host is no longer asymptomatic and can suffer disease from the parasite. Let me give you an example. Toxoplasma gondii is a protozoan parasite which can infect people if they ingest oocytes within feces of infected cats. Usually, these parasites will establish themselves in our tissues without causing any disease. But in pregnancy, which is an immune-compromised state, devastating consequences can occur. The picture you see here is a baby affected by congenital toxoplasmosis. It caused hydrocephalus, which is why his head is so large. His skull is actually filled with a lot of fluid and not much brain tissue. Toxoplasma gondii can also reactivate in other immune-compromised patients, causing disease in the lungs, eyes, and other organs. Even if you are immune-competent, some people are not asymptomatic with parasite infections. Children especially are very affected by nematodes. Here's a picture of a pan full of worms. These are specifically Ascaris lumbricoides. All these worms came out of a single child, a five-year-old in Bangladesh. Children with these nematode infections may not always have physical findings, but the large worm burden steals nutrition from the child. This causes stunting of both physical growth and brain development. The children have cognitive problems and their school performance suffers. This is a diagram of the life cycle of schistosoma. As you can see, it involves two different hosts, a human and snails in many developmental stages. It's a complex life cycle, and it's a good one to explain to you the different types of hosts in a parasite life cycle. Stages that involve reproduction occur in the definitive host. The hosts where larvae develop are called intermediate hosts. And when a parasite enters a wrong host, it can't fulfill its life cycle and dies. And this is called a dead-end host. We've given you examples of all these different types of hosts in the previous slides. Uh, see if you can go back and label them yourself. This diagram also shows you that many parasites have to migrate from their entry into the body to their preferred location. As I mentioned previously, tissue migration can be part of the disease process. Many of these life cycles involve the parasite having to survive a harsh environment, except for those transmitted via vectors. So they produce eggs, or embryonated cysts, in order to survive and in order to successfully transmit to an appropriate host to continue their life cycle. These eggs can be found in soil or water. They can also be found in feces of infected patients, and for some helminths, that can be diagnostic. A test to look for gastrointestinal helminths is called an ova and parasite test, or an ONP. Stool is looked at under the microscope for a distinctive size, shape, or other unique characteristics of the ova to determine the specific helminth causing the infection. 
You will learn more about parasites in this course. Here's a list of the specific protozoa, helminths, and arthropods that you will learn about.